Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx, this TEDx event. is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 2,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lead Student Director Gavin Ault, and I'd like to start by dedicating tonight's event to one of our TED speak speakers from last year, Alex Poliska. Alex is the heart of our TEDx family. Now I'd like to start with an opening prayer. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord, be with us tonight as we open our hearts and our minds to the wisdom and inspiration of these talented speakers. TEDx is a platform where we can come together to share ideas and embark on a journey of knowledge. May we be instruments of peace and change and use what we learn here tonight for the betterment of our own lives and the lives of others. Let us give gratitude for the hard work, talent, and courage present here tonight. And may you guide us in becoming closer to your image of peace, goodness, and love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I would now like to introduce you guys to our MC for the evening, Blake Webster and Mari Snyman. Wow, there's way more people than I thought. Yeah, I know. Hi, I'm Blake, and this is Mari. Welcome to TEDx. First, let me explain a few expectations for this session. But wait, you want to know what's so cool? This? Oh. Oh. I didn't think I was going to land that. <laughs> no, Blake. All these amazing TEDx speakers. Anyways, feel free to clap and maybe even hoot and holler at the end of these Please stay in your seat. If you have to exit or re-enter, please do so in between speakers. We ask that you refrain from capturing photos and recording the talks yet, and instead, focus on being present and listening. We promise we will share professional quality photos and video footage of the event on our Instagram account. To best support the speakers, please try to stay through the whole event. Sorry, I think I'm getting a call. What's up, Mom? Yeah, I'm talking to TEDx right now. Yeah, I'll let them know. All right, love you, bye. Guys, it's Mama's word. You gotta follow the Instagram, TEDxTCHS. Like and follow. We love when you share our content. Yeah, that's right. Anyways, first, we would like to introduce this year's lead organizer, English teacher, Natalia Fiore, and assistant dean of students, Carl Sheen. Let's go. Welcome to the TEDx stage, Ms. Fiore and Mr. Sharif.
siblings, counselors, teachers, and administrators, welcome to the second annual TEDx event at Cathedral. Tonight, you are going to be wowed by students, both as captivating speakers and as the brilliant architects behind this event. Speaking of brilliant architects, we had 32 amazing committee members and 12 phenomenal student speakers. I mean, when we talk about our theme, One School, Many Voices, they embody the diversity of Cathedral. However, before we let them take the helm, I would like to take a few minutes to put the spotlight on the teaching principle that brought this event to life. Project-based learning. <laughs> Discovering the magic of project-based learning. What memorable moment defined your high school experience? Was it scoring a game-winning goal? Taking the stage for a performance? Making a new friend at a retreat? Having your artwork displayed for all to see? Or getting dressed up with your friends for a dance? When every moment that feels significant takes place outside the classroom, it's no wonder that students feel apathetic, distracted, and unmotivated inside the classroom. I grew up in Houston, Texas, where I attended a middle-class Catholic school, St. Pius X, or SPS, go Panthers. <laughs> this is my family and I at my high school graduation. When I think back to those years, I vividly remember dancing during halftime at football games, designing homecoming decor with student council, and having my still life drawing published in the literary and art magazine. However, when I think about class, I recall knowing the exact number of days I could miss before I would have to attend Saturday school, and showing up solely so that I was eligible to attend dance practice at the end of the day. I was a straight-A student, and I loved learning. So why did I dislike school? Go lectures, lifeless textbooks, busy work. It wasn't until I attended college at the University of Notre Dame that I discovered project-based learning through an extracurricular activity I signed up for, yearbook. I started out as staff photographer, moved up to section editor, and ultimately was selected to be the editor-in-chief of the Dome Yearbook. Through participation in this activity, I learned professional photography and design skills, how to write an article, how to collaborate, how to manage a staff, and how to meet deadlines. I learned more through this extracurricular activity than I ever had inside of a classroom. This is one of the core experiences I draw upon in designing an engaging English classroom for my students. This is my sixth year teaching at Cathedral. Every unit I plan is centered around a project with a growth opportunity. Students write short stories, they publish and read aloud to the class. They create professional looking presentations that they deliver with confidence. They design entertaining news productions. They record compelling video essays. They perform spoken word poems, and they write, design, and deliver TED Talks, their favorite project. This project is challenging. This project is transformative. This project is unforgettable. CDL Works defines project-based learning as a teaching method in which students learn by actively engaging in real-world and personally meaningful projects. Many elementary schools embrace project-based learning as it increases engagement. According to Ed News Daily, 74% of elementary school students report feeling highly engaged in class, while only 47% of high school students report feeling highly engaged in class. This disparity clearly points to the fact that project-based learning should be implemented at all levels. Meet my kids, Calista and Hunter. They're seated at the table right over here. Calista is in the fourth grade, and she recently delivered a speech that she had memorized about Greek culture in front of her class. Similarly, my son Hunter last year, dressed as Orville Wright, filmed a speech he had memorized about the founders of aviation. Both kids went above and beyond, learned to research, write, and present, and enjoy the process. Poet Alfred Mercier 
famously stated, what we learn with pleasure, we never forget. Fun and education can go hand in hand so long as the teacher keeps in mind these four essential elements of project-based learning, rigor, creativity, technology, and a presentation. Students must problem solve through rigorous tasks. A few examples include researching, analyzing, writing, designing, reflecting, and refining to complete the complex assignment. This is what leads to the reward feeling students seek. Students must apply creativity, which entails drawing upon their authenticity, curiosity, vulnerability, creative thinking, and risk-taking to produce an original solution. Additionally, students must discern how to creatively display their project. Students must leverage technology. Technological tools provide information, foster collaboration, make models, supply surveys, and offer a variety of creative ways to share one's project. Students need access to real world tools in order to produce the best results. Students must present their work to an audience. The presentation style could include any of the ones I mentioned earlier from my classroom, as well as presenting one's findings, building a model, hosting a workshop, organizing an exhibition, or writing an article. Students are motivated to produce the highest quality work when they know more people are going to view it than just their teacher. Furthermore, for students to be successful, they require clear project goals and expectations, quality resources and instruction, time, examples, and feedback. There should be a variety of group and individual projects so that students learn to work both collaboratively and independently. Importantly, projects should be a component of their curriculum and not the entire course of study. This powerful teaching technique can be skillfully incorporated into all subjects. To make this happen, teachers need two things. One, CBL training specific to their discipline, and two, faith in the curriculum. Should we keep crushing students' creativity and diminishing their love of learning, or should we provide students with the tools and opportunity to thrive in a world that hungers for passionate problem solvers? Remember, it's not about what teachers cover, it's about what students discover. Thank you for your support of project-based learning by attending the second annual TEDx DCHS Magic is in the air. Up next is Reagan Stewart. Reagan is a junior here at Cathedral. She's a member of the Varsity Girls Lacrosse team, president and founder of the club CCHS Teens for Homeless Teens, and president of Morgan's Message Club. She was inspired to write her talk when she saw AI's impact on society today, mainly with high school students. High school students can access more knowledge than ever, but it can be overwhelming. She wanted to inspire her peers to find and use their voices. Welcome, Reagan. Good evening. As high schoolers, we stand on the precipice of independence. We're suddenly responsible for schedules, conversations with teachers, and college applications. But with this freedom comes a daunting question. How do we find our voice? Finding our voice isn't just about having it. It's about having the courage and confidence to share it. But in this time of information overload, creating an opinion can feel like navigating a hurricane of conflicting facts and opinions. There are parents here today. Do you remember when you had an encyclopedia, a handful of news sources, and maybe a library card? Our parents only had a finite set of information to shape their thoughts. But for us, the floodgates opened. With social media, news feeds, and a million opinions spewing from different screens, how do we even know what to trust? This information overload is why many people, especially students, are turning to AI. 
these digital assistants are like miniature research libraries on steroids. AI sifts through mountains of data, prioritizing information based on popularity, proximity, and credibility. It's like having a built-in encyclopedia, but one that constantly learns and adapts. This sounds convenient, right? AI is a powerful tool, but it is just that, a tool. It can't replicate the nuance of human experience, emotion, or the compass of faith. Our conversations with God and unique perspectives formed through personal experiences shape us just as much as any algorithm can. So, you might be wondering, how does AI work? How does AI process information like our own amazing brains? AI is inspired by an essential aspect of the human brain neural networks. Just like the billions of interconnected neurons that fire up in your head, AI algorithms utilize a network of artificial neurons to learn and process information. These neurons are not biological, but are designed to mimic the natural way neurons fire and communicate. Each neuron receives information, processes it, and sends it on forming intricate connections that grow stronger or weaker based on the data they encounter. Earlier this year, in my history class, we were assigned to compare Alexander Hamilton and Thomas Jefferson's policies. I procrastinated on this assignment, leaving me scrambling at the last minute to get it done. I decided to use AI. I asked ChatGPT what it thought about Alexander Hamilton's policies in comparison to Thomas Jefferson's policies. At first, I thought using AI was so convenient. It simplified everything and made my life a lot easier. The next day, in my history class, we had a Socratic seminar which unveiled the ugly truth. As my classmates passionately debated the historical figure's policies, I stood there, mind blank. I could not articulate anything meaningful. Since I had AI sift through the information for me, I could not draw my own conclusions on these historical figures' policies. The rise of AI presents a double-edged sword. While it undeniably offers both convenience and efficiency, its misuse can have detrimental consequences. Take my classmate, who relies on ChatGPT or Quillbot for all their assignments. Sure, they save time in the short run, but at what cost? Their ability to think critically, analyze information, and draw independent conclusions is stunted. They sacrifice intellectual growth for short-term gratification. This, in turn, could affect their future academic and professional success. This is not just about my classmates. It's a growing trend. As you can see from this data, both Gen Z and Millennial are the biggest user group of AI. As students, our primary objective is to learn how to learn. AI can be a powerful asset for research, organization, and creative exploration, but should never replace our critical thinking skills essential to success in any field. Here's the reality. AI feeds us the most popular opinion, the loudest voice in the echo chamber. But history is formed by those who dare to break free, who choose a different melody amidst the chorus. And that, my friends, is where courage comes in. Yes, embrace AI and use it to navigate the information storm, but don't let it drown out your voice. Listen to your heart and draw from your experiences, and don't be afraid to disagree with the digital chorus. Be bold, be different, and be the change you want to see in the world. AI can be our ally, not our crutch. Allow it to empower us to climb higher and to think more deeply. Use it to learn different perspectives and challenge your assumptions, but ultimately let your God-given soul and mind be your voice. Remember, the most influential voice isn't the one that repeats itself the most, but the one that speaks with its unique experience and truth. So, my fellow students, let's silence the echoes of conformity and raise the chorus of our voices. Allow AI to guide us, but let our hearts be our compass. Speak with courage, conviction, and a unique melody of our soul. Let's create a symphony 
of diverse perspectives into harmony reflecting the human experiences writ this. Thank you. Up next is Patsy Hellman. Patsy Hellman is a sophomore from Del Mar. She's a member of the varsity cross country, track, water polo, and swim and dive teams. She loves the beach, baking, and spending time with her friends. Patsy is a member of the French Honor Society and leader of the Ripple Effect Club on campus. She was inspired by her own journey in sports and the powerful female athletes that fight for and impact change within the sports industry. Give it up for Patsy. Picture this, you're standing in a sports arena after playing your heart out and winning the title of your dreams. The lights are blaring, the air is cool on your skin, your heart is like a pound out of your chest, a smile plastered from ear to ear. Now imagine the first question that an interviewer asks you after this incredible feat that you just put your heart and soul into is this. Could you give us a twirl and tell us about your outfit? Hi, my name is Patsy Hellman. And today, I will be talking to you about gender disparities within the sports industry regarding media, marketing, and funding, and ways that we can make a change. Men and women should be regarded as equals in terms of opportunity and publicity within the industry. Executives must implement just media and marketing policies to level the playing field. First, I want you to keep in mind that as I talk about women in sport, while I may be referencing professionals and collegiate athletes, at the root of the issue, I'd be talking about all women in sport, who are daughters, sisters, friends, neighbors. Being an athlete helps to develop vital skills, including teamwork, leadership, and a driven work ethic. I play a few sports here at Cathedral myself. I run track and cross country, I play water polo, and I do swim and dive. I see the skills that I play in my sports, that I learn in my sports, play out in my life daily. Investment in women's sports goes beyond investment in just the game. It means investment in empowerment, breaking barriers, and rewriting the narrative of what women can achieve. The history of women in sports is long marked by discrimination and limited opportunity. Progress accelerated in the 20th century with breakthroughs such as women's acceptance into the Olympics, the birth of the Women's Sports Foundation, and the passing of Title IX in the US. However, challenges continue to persist, including lack of representation and unequal pay. Each of these issues exists independently, yet they are influenced by one another. It is like a tangled web where every issue exists on its own, but serves as both the cause and effect of another. Let's break it down. If everyone in this room represented an athlete, four in every 10 of you would be a woman. Women make up 40% of all sports athletes, yet they receive only about 5% of sports media coverage. Washington Mystics basketball star Elena Della Dunn said, when you put millions of dollars into marketing athletes and allowing fans to get to know a player, they develop a connection, are more engaged, and continue to want to see and learn more. How is anyone going to get to know me or any of my colleagues if we aren't marketed as much? Della Dunn points to expectations presented to women to generate revenue on par with their male counterparts while continuing to lack the funding for media. Marketing. Audiences will inevitably gravitate towards athletes that they see idolized in the media. When women continue to lack the funding for marketing, audiences will gravitate toward male athletes when it comes to turning on a sports game to see their favorite players play. The second point in this cycle is pay. It is a widely known fact that women are paid substantially less than many of their male counterparts in many sports leagues and tournaments. Collegiate institutions dedicate 33% of collegiate athletic scholarship funds, 24% of athletic operating budgets, and 16% of recruitment budgets on women. Colleges support male athletic programs while seeming to lack funding for women's athletic departments. When colleges support men and seem to lack the funding for women, it demonstrates a blatant lack of support for female athletes beginning at the collegiate level. Finally, women in sports are often overlooked for their achievements and the focus placed on their appearance. 
the Norwegian women's beach handball team won four shorts in the tournament in protest of sexualized uniform guidelines and were fined 1,500 euros with threat of exclusion from the tournament for their improper clothing. This seems strange and confusing when taking a look at the men's beach handball team who wears shorts that fall just about four inches above the knee. Additionally, in gymnastics, uniforms seem to be designed to be practical for men while being revealing for women. And the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, the German national women's gymnastics team wore unitards rather than leotards in protest of sexualization. Three-time Olympian, German Olympian Elizabeth Seitz told reporters in Tokyo that it was about what felt comfortable. They wanted to show that everybody, every woman, should decide what they wear. Amidst these challenges, there are countless narratives of female athletes challenging stereotypes and breaking barriers, including Serena Williams and the US national women's soccer team who fought to ensure that all Team USA athletes receive equal pay and benefits, regardless of gender. Events such as the Olympics provide insight into what it looks like for men and women to be equally marketed on a global level and where gaps between, viewer gaps between genders vanish. We've addressed the issues, but now what can we do about it? Should we continue to allow female athletes to be sidelined by existing media and marketing policies, or should we challenge gender stereotypes and uplift women in sports? Promoting female athletes, celebrating women's achievements, and continuing to break challenge gender stereotypes can help fuel the movement to reshape the narrative surrounding women in sports. Equitable sponsorship opportunities, equal media coverage, and investment in women's sports can help to break down these barriers. These disparities are not inevitable. They're systematic, rooted in outdated perceptions and institutional biases. Every stream, every purchase, every cheer, and every voice can and will help to achieve gender equality, and sports representation. Challenge stereotypes and support women. Thank you. Up next is my mentee, Pierce Millar. Pierce is a freshman from Del Mar. He is the president of Students for Hire, an active member of numerous other clubs on campus, such as Don Mentoring Dons and the Scuba Diving Club. He participates in multiple sports, including basketball and swimming, while simultaneously running, running one of the biggest Boy Scouts of America troops in Southern California. He enjoys volunteering across San Diego and clocked in over 100 hours so far this year at Saving Horses Incorporated. He was inspired to write his TED Talk after seeing the effects entrepreneurship had on himself. Now he wants to share this with others. Please welcome to the TEDx stage, Pierce. Who would have guessed that an app designed by a 19-year-old Harvard student to rate the attractiveness of fellow students at university would lead him to becoming one of the world's leading billionaires? Mark Zuckerberg found success developing Facebook as a teenager, one of the most popular social media apps that has transformed the world of social networking. He has revolutionized how we interact online and paved the way for modern day social media. He is a remarkable, so we're supposed to laugh, example of what is possible if young people take chances on their dreams, ideas, and businesses. And that is what I'm here to share with you all today. There is power in teenage entrepreneurship. Young people have immense potential to pave the way towards a better future through their businesses and other endeavors. But who am I, and why am I so qualified to talk about this? My name is Pierce Millar, and while I'm only a freshman here at CCHS, I've been the founder of many small businesses. And today, I want to simplify the path to entrepreneurship into three main pillars. So not only becomes easier, but also more accessible to our community and the students within. My first entrepreneur endeavor was when I was only 11. At the time, we lived in a small beach town outside of LA, and I constantly biked everywhere. I was tired of having to put my shoes on, bike to the beach, and take them off when I got there. Identifying my problem, I brainstormed solutions and came up with a new product, Grassy Pedal, a bike pedal that allowed users to bike to the beach while, bar while barefoot by using artificial turf on the top of pedals. Although this Etsy page was made more than four years ago, the page is still up and I occasionally receive orders to this day. I may not have made millions, but I learned my first pillar of entrepreneurship, taking chances. You must start by embodying this Wayne Gretzky quote, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. 
Although this statement may be overused, it is 100% true. If you never try something, you will never really fail because you'll never give yourself the chance to succeed. And the first leap doesn't always have to be a big one. It could just be experimenting with an idea or considering the logistics. The important part is that you're putting your ideas out into the world. And remember this, too many ideas and opportunities are thrown away, so don't contribute to more of them. Two years later for my birthday, I received a 3D printer, and I love making all sorts of things and giving them to families and friends. One day while at middle school, I saw fidget cubes and poppets exploding, and I knew I had to have one. As a seventh grader, I couldn't just go and ask my mom to buy me one, so I decided to find a free file online and 3D print it. The next day I came to school, everyone wanted one of my creations. I had tons of kids asking, can you make me one, and I'll pay you. As soon as I heard the word pay, money symbols filled my head. I got to work printing them multiple colors and combinations to ensure my customers would be satisfied with the product. I figured that I could sell them for $15 a piece and while they only cost a cent to make. I sold around 10 of them daily, profiting nearly $150 a day. I learned that I not only needed a good idea, but what I really needed was a good marketing strategy. I knew that in middle school, many kids are influenced by what the most well-liked kid in school has. So I went to the three most popular kids in the grade and gave them free cubes to play with in class. I also told them I'd give them a small commission on every order that they brought in. As soon as they were seen sporting my new cubes on campus, everyone wanted one. So, I learned that I not only needed a good idea, but an amazing marketing strategy. But at the time, I didn't know, but I was using a more scaled down version of influence marketing. Influence marketing is a marketing strategy that puts the product in the hands of people whose lives are aspirational. By doing so, the consumers see these celebrities and influencers and wanna buy the product to emulate their lives. This is one of many different marketing strategies is that you can do. I suggest implementing many of them and then seeing which has the most significant ROI, return on investment, and which makes your company the most money. And remember this, as soon as you figure out the key to marketing, your audience won't be able to resist your product. After I graduated middle school and entered Cathedral Catholic High School, the idea for my most recent startup came to mind, Students for Hire, a local club and business on campus that enables parents to post jobs for students to do. The students can make some extra cash on the side while while not having to commit to a full-time job. It's in the App Store and the Google Play Store, so you all should go download it. When I first started my company, I was overworked and losing lots of sleep. I never let anyone else in my company because I feared that by doing so, I would lose control and therefore no longer be mine. Instead, here's the truth. By leveraging the third pillar, delegation, a business becomes exponentially more productive. By eliminating the busy work for the creative mind, I found that by allowing my friends in and having them draft emails and schedule my meetings, I could work on getting the app designed and published. They could add personal touches to my emails and they could handle my schedule better than I ever could. So, remember this. Every challenge is an opportunity, every setback a lesson, every dream a possibility waiting to be realized. Starting without these principles is akin to constructing a brick wall without its foundational bricks leading to its eventual collapse. So go out into the world, start taking leaps, marketing to your target audience and delegating tasks to your friends. And finally, start living your dreams. Thank you. Next is Lindsay Zimmer. Lindsay Zimmer is a sophomore at Cathedral. She's a member of the varsity track, cross country, and water polo team. She's a member of National Charity League and has twice won the Merrick Award for most philanthropic hours served in the chapter. She was inspired to write her talk from her own journey to health, and she hopes to help others start their journey with nutrition. Please welcome Lindsay. Sickness destroyed my life. And I'm not talking about having a stuffy nose or a sore throat. I'm talking about bronchitis, respiratory viruses, sinus infections, and anemia. I constantly try to improve my health, my running times, and my comprehension abilities at school, but every time I started to improve, I was knocked back down and plagued with a new virus. I missed out on countless opportunities with my friends, my family. I watched others achieve the goals I once had, and I struggled to make it through life daily. I was desperate to find a solution, so I decided to take action. I started a new diet. This diet consisted of the consumption of purely whole foods and cutting out of all processed foods. I didn't start this diet for the usual reasons. I started this diet to finally be healthy again. 
Sure, this diet was hard, but after two to three weeks, my body started to not crave the food that once had it. Candy, popcorn, pizza, and almost immediately, I noticed improvement. All aspects of my life became better. I was less stressed about school. I could focus in the classroom. I improved my running time, and most importantly, my health drastically improved. I was able to firsthand experience food for thought and the power that diet had to create a 360 shift in my life. The National Institute of Health states that we have more bacteria cells in our body than human cells, and these are congregated in the gut, which is known as the microbiome. These millions upon trillions of bacteria are crucial. Bacteria is what helps us fight against viruses and infections. Bacteria neutralizes the toxins in our body. Bacteria's importance in our body cannot be stressed enough. This new diet was my answer. I had cracked the code to living a healthy and fulfilling life. I had activated my microbiome. But what is the microbiome? The microbiome is the congregation of all bacteria in the gut, which plays a role in virtually all physiological processes in the human body. These roles can include synthesizing proteins, regulating immune, mind, and body function. The most important factor in nutrition is the microbiome, and properly feeding your microbiome is the key to living a healthy and balanced life. To ensure the best activation of your microbiome, it's a two-step process. First, shopping for locally sourced whole foods, and second, implementing these foods into a daily diet plan. The more of these whole foods you consume will result in an equilibrium of bacteria, which is linked to, but not limited to, improved gut health, lowering the chances of obesity and inflammation. The first step in ensuring the best activation of your microbiome is the four. And this is a guilty pleasure a lot of Americans have, shopping. Shopping can either further help you or further hurt you. Take a look at this image of a local lawn. The outer aisles are home to the produce section, which house whole, nutritious, and healthy foods, whereas the center aisles are full of processed foods that contain additives and preservatives to make them last longer. Americans need to start shopping on the perimeter, but it doesn't end there. Grocery stores will usually import meat that is the most cost-effective without taking the quality of that meat into consideration. This meat can be full of hormones, antibiotics, and other harmful substances. Instead, a great alternative is shopping at a local farmer's market or butchery, which allows you to support a local business while also ensuring that you're getting the best quality meat. This combination of shopping on the perimeter and shopping locally allows for the best result of acquiring food. The next step is a little more difficult, but I know you guys got it. This is when you actually have to plan a daily diet full of foods that are healthy for your microbiome. A common misconception is that eating for your microbiome has to be vegetables, tofu, or kimchi, or those are always great options for your microbiome. Your favorite foods can also benefit your gut health. What about a delicious yogurt parfait, refreshing fruit, or rich overnight oats recipe. These are all great ideas that will help contribute to your gut health. On top of that, there are hundreds of meal plans and recipes that will help curate protein-packed meals that will align to your preferences. If you're still lost, let me take you through a day of eating to give you some ideas. For breakfast, I had a rich overnight oats recipe topped with bananas, blueberry, granola, and honey. At school, I got hungry, so I decided to snack on a portable veggie tray. And later for lunch, I had chicken tacos topped with veggies and cilantro that I had packed that morning. At dinner, I got a little lazy, so I stopped at one of my favorite food places, Sweet Green, and ordered my regular bowl. I know that I have a large sweet tooth, so for dessert, I had chickpea cookie dough sweetened with dates. Sure, eating like this is hard, but do you know what else is hard? Coughing up a storm day in and day out and feeling unmotivated and drowsy every day. For me, the sacrifice was 100% worth it. 
And now I greatly enjoy eating these whole, unprocessed foods. And actually, on a microbial level, our bodies are meant for whole, unprocessed foods. So why are we not feeding it that? After shopping consistently and eating consistently, I think you deserve a reward. How does better brain cognitive function feel? What about better sleep? What about subsided depression? What about less bloating? What about reduced inflammation? What about lowering the chances of obesity? What about improved gut health? All of these results are directly linked to improved gut health. So the choice is now yours. If you're still not convinced, it's probably because of one of two reasons. The first is worrying that you're not going to get the satisfaction from your favorite processed snack. If you're worried about getting that flavorful crunch from Doritos or another chip brand, a great alternative is crispy, protein-packed almonds seasoned to your preference and to perfection. There are hundreds of whole food recipes and snacks that will keep you satisfied throughout the day. For me, I love snacking on a veggie tray, eating some crispy grapes or refreshing fruit. If there's one thing you take away from this image, let it be the word colorful. Eating the rainbow allows for our body to be filled with fiber, nutrients, probiotics, and prebiotics. If you are worried about being hungry, the statistics about the volume of whole foods are shocking. A single slice of pizza has anywhere from 250 to 300 calories, opposed to one of my favorite recipes, stuffed bell peppers, which is a third of the calories and equally delicious. When we eat whole foods, we can eat roughly three times the amount compared to processed foods. Processed foods leave us feeling guilty and unsatisfied in our body, whereas whole foods leave us feeling confident and satisfied. So the choice is now yours. If you decide you want to start improving your gut health and make millions upon trillions of bacteria happy, I can promise you it'll be worth it. So before I leave, I want to pose one final question. Do you have the guts to start your new nutritionally balanced life? Thank you. Next up is Mia Fisher. Mia is a sophomore here at Cathedral. She's a member of the CCHS cheer team and finds joy through photography and painting. Mia is president of her National Charity, Charity League class and has completed a total of 235 philanthropy hours. Her talk was inspired by her childhood love of Disney animated films and her realization of their impact on young children. Let's go, Mia. As a young girl, I was obsessed with Disney princesses. I strived to sing like Aurora, be intelligent like Belle, resilient like Mulan, and fall in love like Rapunzel. As I grew up, the narrative was rewritten. Jasmine's perfect figure was my envy. Ursula had taken away my voice, and Flynn Riders turned into deceptive prince haunts. I found myself waiting for someone to rescue me from my problems and told myself, maybe I would be happy if I had a sidekick, fairy godmother, or charming prince. Almost every single person has a memory related to Disney. Now, close your eyes and imagine this. A doctor's office waiting room, sterile and cold, until Cinderella plays on a small television and the fear of vaccinations is replaced with excitement for the film. A long road trip. Hot seats and nausea leave your senses when songs from Sleeping Beauty are placed over your ears and joy erupts in the curve of a smile as Aurora awakes from her sleep. Now open your eyes. For 87 years, Disney has dominated children's media, creating characters viewers fall in love with, dress up as, and idolize. But what if I told you 
the childhood cinematic masterpiece of Disney Princess Films was creating detrimental problems in our society. Viewers of Disney Princess Films need to be aware of the effects on their self-esteem and stereotypes from these films. The children's movie industry, dominated by Disney, is exploiting viewers to believe only one idea to be true. In diversifying and writing new stories, Disney would create a larger sense of empathy with their viewers. Beauty and the Beast said it best, a tale as old as time, as true as it can be. Gender stereotypes, confining beauty standards, and racial inequality in Disney princess films plants the seeds of predetermined notions, insecurity, and racism. Disney plays a major role in child development by using a female heroine to communicate character building topics. By the age of six, the brain has grown to 95% of its adult size, meaning the first few years of a child's life are crucial in shaping their view of the world. With the target audience of children under 10, Disney conveys characters that overcome obstacles for children to relate to. Despite these challenges, such as poverty, cruelty, and loss, Disney encourages children that there will always be a happy ever after. With the common theme of staying positive while being resilient, children can develop a we can do it mindset. Children's ideas of gender identities, romantic relationships, and life choices are highly affected by Disney princess media. Lauren Gissel, writer and psychologist, found that 65% of Disney princess movies emphasize the goal of achieving marriage and falling in love. All the Disney princess movies have a detrimental resolution in common, that somebody will save you from your problems. But recently, other production companies such as Netflix have rewritten what it means to be a princess. In the movie Damsel, written and played by Millie Bobby Brown, the lead character is married off to a prince, but later must save herself and her sisters from his evil plan. Out of all the Disney princesses, two stand out from the rest, Mulan and Moana. Both these stories share the common theme of defying social norms in order for the greater good. Disney should grow from these two princesses that display the princesses in courageous, powerful light rather than a victim needing a savior. Disney princesses teach children that how they look is more important than the content of their mind. Psychology of Popular Media conducted a study and found a direct correlation between the body standard of a princess and how the child viewed themselves. So, Let's take a look at the heroes versus the villains in Disney princess films. As you can see here, the princesses are portrayed as beautiful and the villains portrayed as ugly. Children will learn to associate positive characteristics such as kindness with appealing looks and negative characteristics such as evil with the unattractive. In the eyes of society, the perfect female is equivalent to tiny waist big eyes, and long hair. Similarly to Disney's portrayal of gender roles, racial stereotypes in Disney princess films teach children to prejudge others based on appearance. From the King Street Chronicle, Madison Hart describes that out of the 13 Disney princesses, only five are races other than white. While Tiana, the only black princess, spends 60% of her entire movie as a frog and not a princess, Aurora spends her time sleeping in a gown in Snow White frolicking with the dwarves. Instead of remaking classic films such as Ariel, Disney should harness their creativity by producing new, diverse, original characters. Disney is attempting to modernize the recent films, but falls short by recreating live-action remakes of their older movies. It is important to monitor and analyze the films our children are watching for they learn many lessons from the content. Our society is ignorant to the underlying themes in Disney princess films causing harm to societal growth. When we let the media impact our minds, creates a lack of individuality of thought. Body image insecurity, gender stereotypes, and racial inequality would be largely prevented by diversifying character storylines and production companies of children's movies. So, enjoy the songs, childlike romance, 
and movies, but be aware of the ideas per taken as truth, for it is difficult for, for children to separate from reality. Remember, Disney princesses are not perfection, and that imperfection is tied to individuality. The idea of a dreamy romance, thrilling adventure, or a savior from your troubles may enrich your life, but one must truly find the form of love every single Disney princess has, the love of oneself. Thank you. Up next is Andrew. Raised in Oceanside by an adventurous family of five, sophomore Andrew Martinez always had an enthusiasm for trying new things. Inspired by his brothers, he participates as a varsity runner of the cross country and track team. Andrew also strives to contribute to his community through his service as a member of the CSF, Surf Rider Foundation, and ambassador program on campus. With a passion for pushing boundaries, Andrew aims to inspire others to embrace discomfort as a catalyst for growth in his TED Talk, Beyond the Barrier. Welcome, Andrew. Take a moment and think to yourself about the last time you avoided something because it was too uncomfortable or too risky. Now imagine if you lived your entire life with this cautious mindset, held captive by your doubts, too scared to try anything new, too scared to achieve your dreams. Ask yourself, would I rather be uncomfortable momentarily or live a lifetime full of regret? The comfort zone is a psychological state in which one functions in a stress-neutral environment, providing stability at the cost of limiting growth. In our comfort-driven society, we find solace in familiar and consistent routines. Despite the benefit of these routines, only with new experiences can we truly foster growth. Through managing stress, trying new things, and embracing our failures, we can achieve the success that lies beyond the barrier of our comfort zones. I'm scared of public speaking along with 70% of the population. This talk itself is outside of my comfort zone, but it's through embracing this discomfort that facilitates growth. Let me take you back to a small and dimly lit theater. In it is a short boy forced to partake in a summer musical. Timidly waiting for his cue, he stands behind a curtain, hands sweating, heart pounding, envisioning all the little things that can go wrong. He hears his cue, steps out into the spotlight, and begins his solo. Starting the song strong, a smile begins to form on his face. His confidence begins to build. And then click, all of a sudden, music cuts out. He stumbles his lines and cracks his voice trying to recover. And he hesitates, face flushed red. Submerged in uncomfortable stress, he makes a choice and keeps on singing. The song ends and despite having a rough time, 10-year-old me is overcome with joy. As I persevered through stress, the weight of my fears were lifted and replaced with a sense of liberation and empowerment. While stress may seem inherently detrimental, studies such as the Erickson Dodson Law have proven that it is directly proportional to performance. So as stress increases, so does success. While stress does increase performance due to heightened levels of, of focus, I don't recommend immediately throwing yourself into high stress scenarios because true and consistent growth develops an equidistance between comfort and panic. The resilience I learned in the face of this balanced stress reframed my entire perception of what I believe I could accomplish. And it's this new outlook on life that inspired me to try new things, broadening my perspective and cultivating a creative mindset, facing unfamiliar challenges forced my brain to learn how to adapt. I began to embrace uncertainty and take risks. When one steps outside of their comfort zone, they're exploring new territory, creating new pathways between neurons. These additional synapses, forged by unfamiliar situations, increase the brain's neuroplasticity. As we begin to age, our brains accumulate a natural plaque, deteriorating our cognitive functioning. The more synapses and greater neuroplasticity we have, the longer our brains can stay sharp and healthy. So by stepping outside your comfort zone, you are effectively prolonging your ability to think. 
With all these benefits, what is stopping people from embracing discomfort? A central fear and likely outcome of leaving your comfort zone is failure. 2,774. That's how many failed experiments Thomas Edison conducted. The 2,775th one being the first commercially viable light bulb. Edison knew that despite the setbacks that were and will be a product of taking risks, success is built in adversity. Imagine all the opportunities you could miss out on by remaining in your comfort zone. All the doors of possibility shut because of a petty fear of discomfort, a petty fear of failure. Face these fears of being judged, criticized, and imperfect. Take that leap of faith out of your comfort zone and step into success, pushing beyond these imaginary barriers and limitations and discover your true potential. Begin to appreciate that we can learn from our mistakes and bounce back because every failure carries with it the seed of a greater benefit. So don't let your doubts define or diminish your dreams because by staying in your confident comfort, you are dooming yourself to a life of regret. Similarly, confined within a chrysalis, a seemingly irrelevant caterpillar designed for greatness. It breaks away from its cocoon, emerging into the world in a bloom of beauty. Despite having humble beginnings, the monarch butterfly is one of the many insects contributing to over 90% of the world's pollination, vital to the global ecosystem. Just like a caterpillar, imagine the beauty the world would miss out on if you stayed confined in your own cocoon of comfort, never pushing yourself, never growing, never achieving your dreams. In a society plagued with the fear of the uncomfortable, it is necessary for you to break beyond your own barrier barriers. So go to a place you've never been before. Learn a new instrument. Talk to a stranger. Try a different recipe. Because in the words of Neil Walsh, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Thank you. And that concludes the first session of TEDx EPHF Week. We hope you have enjoyed the talk so far, and we have a whole bunch more coming after a 30-minute intermission. Feel free to introduce yourself to new people around you, as well as grab any pre-ordered food and drinks in the theater lobby where you checked in. Just a quick reminder, there are letters on your guys' tables to write notes to the speakers and or committee members. We'll be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, our second session will begin in 15 minutes. Once again, our second session will begin in 15 minutes. Thank you, and roll dogs.
Everybody, this is a five minute reminder to take your seats. Thank you.
please take your seats. Thank you. Welcome back. Just a quick reminder to please stay in your seats and only exit in between the speakers if necessary. Thank you. Up first is our keynote speaker, Graham Bowsley. Graham Bowsley is the head boys basketball coach here at Cathedral. He just completed his first year leading the team to 19 wins a CIF Open Division appearance, and a CIF State Playoff berth. He is a 15-year veteran of NCAA Division I college basketball and has been part of seven NCAA tournament teams. He has developed a number of professional basketball players as a coach, including Jalen Pickett on the Denver Nuggets. He is a Southern California native attending Campbell, High, Campbell Hall High School in Northern Hollywood and amassing a record of 91 and seven, 91 and seven as a varsity basketball player, including, including two CIF state championships and one undefeated season. He was inspired to, to share his pers perspective on success and leadership through his adventurous journey in both his playing and coaching experience in basketball. Please give an extra warm welcome to our coach, Graham Bowsley. What do you have in common with Batman, Wonder Woman, and Spider-Man? Every great story starts with a hero. What if I told you that you were the hero on your journey, and your journey begins right now? Joseph Campbell wrote a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. In this book, he talks about the monomyth. The monomyth is a story structure that all the great stories and myths of our time follow. Picture yourself as the unassuming hero about to embark on a journey full of peaks, valleys, and multiple climbs. This journey could be a lot of things. You could be an athlete beginning your season. You could be a student ready to start your sophomore year. Or you could be a professional beginning a new job. How are you going to have success on this journey and get buy-in? Fearless to grow is a philosophy to help you structure and champion this journey. It's a mindset that encourages calculated risks and understands that the journey is not going to be perfect and it's going to be messy. Joseph Campbell talks about this in his book. Every hero goes through a period called the descent. This is where that hero faces an extraordinary challenge and gets to a valley and then overcomes it. I challenge you on your journey to reframe this part. Look at this valley not as an obstacle 
but as a period of your journey where you will grow the most. This philosophy was inspired by my personal and professional journey. On my journey, I learned three key values, humility, reliability, and dedication. So I worked hard to try to be the best varsity basketball player on my team. I had a personal goal to be a Division I basketball player. But throughout my time, I learned I wasn't going to be the best player. My teammate was Drew Holiday, who's still playing for the Boston Celtics. This is where I learned humility. I reframed my efforts. I had to be the best leader I can be, and I had to find a critical role to be a part of a great team. I did. And our team went 91-7 and seven over three years, won two state championships, and had one undefeated season. The importance of humility to me is embodied by this quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. At my senior banquet, my coach said I could have transferred and played for any team in our league and been the best player. But what I wanted was to stay and be a part of a special team that ultimately changed my life. And I still accomplished my personal goal, albeit in a different role. That's me holding the clipboard and towel uh, in practice for Hall of Fame coach Bo Ryan at the University of Wisconsin. So I made it, but not in the most glamorous role. My freshman year at Wisconsin, I tried out to be a part of that team and earn a scholarship, and I didn't make it. Uh, my visions of grandeur were dashed, but, you know, armed with humility, I'm like, all right, I'll pivot, okay? I'll apply to be a student manager. And at Wisconsin and a lot of the Big Ten, there's hundreds of applicants to be student managers every year. And at Wisconsin, we carried as many as 20 student managers every year. And so I applied for that, and I'm like, all right, you know. And student managers at Wisconsin, you know, we were a part of practice, and you played a critical role on the scout team where you could simulate the other team's plays. So I'd have a chance to play and be a part of a Division I basketball team. But... I hit another valley, I didn't get that either. And so I went home like dejected. Uh, this was another valley and I'm like, how can I overcome this? And I'm, I'm looking at that opportunity and I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna grow. And I sought out a job at UCLA summer basketball camps. And now the camp director, he didn't know me, um, but my buddy Drew was signed up to play basketball there the next year, and he was the number one nationally ranked recruit at the time, so that might have helped me get my foot in the door. Um, but so, I, so he hired me that first week, and he just kind of tested me to see how I do. And that's where I learned my second lesson, reliability, that next value. And, you know, I was like, how am I going to earn this guy's trust? And what I decided was I'm going to earn this guy's trust and have him count on me by being available as possible. And, like, whatever job, no matter how big, coaching a kid's team being a guest speaker to small when all the kids leave picking up the trash. 
And by doing that and doing a great job of that, I earned a position at all six weeks of the summer camp. And that camp director wrote a glowing recommendation for me to be a part of the Wisconsin student manager group. And he even introduced me to one of my heroes, John Wooden, uh, an experience I'll never forget. But Hall of Fame coach Bill Parcells said, the best ability is availability. And I secured my career in coaching because I not only found a way to have a role on a team and be a superstar in that role, but also be available and reliable no matter how big or small the job was because that earned trust in my employers. And that catalyzed my entire coaching career. And so I've, I've had a pretty unconventional path in coaching. Uh, you know, I've, I've been, I coached 15 years in Division I basketball, and I held various roles in successful organizations, and I was fortunate to be a part of seven NCAA tournament teams, and I got to coach a lot of professional players too, which was really fun. One of those guys, Jalen Pickett, who's shown in the middle, um, you know, who, who invited me to be there in his hometown of Rochester when he heard his name called in the second round of the NBA draft. And that was a really special moment for me as a coach. Um, and, you know, I, I learned throughout my coaching journey that sustained success doesn't happen without dedication. Dedication to your passion, dedication to your craft, dedication to the people in your organization. President Theodore Roosevelt said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And what that looks like to me as a coach is not only being dedicated to the X's and O's, coaching on the court, but maybe more so being dedicated off the court, seeking out meaningful relationships, intentionally seeking them out. And through my ongoing journey in coaching, uh, like it's the, one of the most rewarding parts of it is that shared struggle, that shared sacrifice, and being dedicated and going above and beyond any type of job description. So we're back. You're the unassuming hero about to begin your journey. How will you show up? Are you going to be armed with these values and keep perspective through the peaks and valleys? As you can see in this diagram, you as the unassuming hero can't see the destination from where you start. But I challenge you, be fearless to grow and leave here and start your journey today because you never know at what wonderful destination you'll end up at. Thank you. Bowman Yanaselli is next. Bowman Yanaselli is a sophomore from Del Mar. He plays football and rugby, volunteers with TVIA, Teen Volunteers in Action, and is on the TVIA Leadership Council. Inspired by his ever encouraging parents and knack for planning ahead, he strives to enlighten his audience with the knowledge to look forward and live out their true calling. Welcome, Bowman. Meet my dad, Michael Yonaselli. 
He's a real estate developer for his own personal business, Cash Street Devco. And his job is to buy land, zone areas, design, and build buildings. One thing you would not know from this little prefix is that he can tell you anything, and I mean anything, about rocks. You see, for five whole years, he worked as a geologist. He worked for huge oil companies, finding massive oil deposits using his, using his extensive knowledge of geology. Now this, this is Steve Jobs. He's the Atari video game developer that founded Apple, one of the richest companies in the world. When I ask you to compare these two people, the first thing that might come to mind is, I don't know, my dad's bushy beard or maybe even Steve Jobs' receding hairline. But what if I tell you it went much deeper than that? What if I told you it was the fact that both of these people switched their careers incredibly late or that neither of them had any idea what they wanted to be while still in high school? Today, we will be taking a deep dive into why 30% of high school graduates have no idea what they want to do with the rest of their lives. We'll be uncovering different methods and ways that high schoolers can use to find their dream career. Now listen, everyone in this room has at least a faint elementary experience. I don't know, the first day of school. Everyone in this room remembers the unique, unique smell of a third grade classroom. The relentless chatter in the background of the giant six foot four tall teacher standing down and asking you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And while other people had more exciting answers, like maybe a firefighter, astronaut, or maybe even a superhero, mine was more boring or mundane. You see, I personally wanted to be an architect. Every single day of my childhood, I spent hours upon hours building Legos. I was obsessed. I loved designing, creating, and even destroying them, and it's where my love for architecture truly blossomed. But as we grow older, times change, and so do people. So when faced with the question, what do I want to do when I grow up now? I realize that I have multiple different paths that I can go down, and my horizons have broadened. Choosing your career is an incredibly important part of anyone's life, but it's often a hard decision. By using methods such as understanding yourself, by understanding yourself, doing lots of research into multiple jobscapes, and implementing the process of Ikigai, it can be made much easier. Let's start us off with understanding ourselves. I mean, it's incredibly important when picking your career. I mean, you're literally marrying this job for the next 50 years, and divorce isn't really an option. You might be thinking to yourself, you might be thinking to yourself, I know myself, I'm me. I challenge that. Right now, I want you to think of three things that you're exceptionally good at. Not just all right at or okay at, but amazing at. Write them down or make a mental note. Later, I want you to ask your best friend, what are three things I'm really good at? The answers will 100% surprise you. You will find tons of things out, depending on who you ask, of things that you didn't know that you were amazing at, that you are great at. Do this to deepen your understanding of how other people see you, therefore increasing your understanding of yourself. Go back to that age-old question. What do you want to be when you grow up? When you ask it to someone who's young, um, naturally they're going to have an ever-changing answer. I mean, I place a solid amount of money on my ability to convince a seven-year-old to change their dream profession. But as we get older, our vision seems to narrow, and we seem to focus on one job, one thing that we really want to do. And in my opinion, that's why 32% of college-educated individuals change their job after only three years in the workforce. You might be thinking, how can I experiment? How can I try out a bunch of different jobs so that I can keep my eyes wide? I mean, I can't just apply for 100 different jobs and work them all at the same time. That's impossible. And while you might be right, I do challenge your ability to experiment. I mean, to start off, there are hundreds upon hundreds of free online courses that you can take from high caliber schools, such as Stanford or Harvard, all taught by incredibly educated professors that know way more about the jobscape than you do. Secondly, listen, with just a quick Google search, you can find thousands of audiobooks written by hundreds of different people with different ideologies, views, personalities, on practically any subject or job. Finally, everyone in this room has the ability to ask questions. You have the ability to ask questions, you have the ability to ask questions, even I have the ability to ask questions. So do it. Interview your friends, family members, 
people you look up to, the people that you, that have the jobs that you really want and find out their personal experiences with that certain job scape. Also, do all this so that your final decision can be an educated one. Some of you might be thinking to yourself, the process of Ikigai, what's that? Is it some sort of ice cream or sushi? The answer is no. Um, Ikigai is an ancient Chinese um, way of thinking that can be used to find your dream profession. You see, it can be represented by this graph here. There are four different parts. There's doing what you love, doing what you're good at, doing what affects your community, and most importantly, doing what makes you money. <laughs> Finding that centerpiece that has all four of those sections, that's called Ikigai. And it's incredibly important when balancing your life and your job. While it may be true that finding your dream profession late after you've already studied or worked for years on something else isn't the end of the world, it is 100% a major setback. And that's why finding your profession early is so important. I mean, Steve Jobs said it himself. The only way to do good work is to love the work that you do. High school students have a long and winding road ahead of them if they plan on being successful. So if you're closing in on graduation and you want to find your dream profession, then by studying Ikigai, doing as much research as you can, do as many jobs as you can, and truly understanding yourself, you will get closer to finding your goals. Think of yourself 50 years in the future. You wake up every single day dreading the job that you go to. The hate, the stress, and the pain, and the workload of a job that you don't even want to go to is weighing you down and bringing your life. Now think of a very similar situation but you love your job. It's 50 years in the future, you wake up every day. Birds chirping, sun shining. You can't wait to go to work. You can't wait to improve on and get better at what you do because you truly love doing what you do. So if you're one of the three in 10 high schoolers that has no idea what they want to do when they grow up, then follow these steps, find your own path, and pick your perfect career. Thank you. Up next is Nyla King Boyd. Nyla is a senior and ambassador for Christ and serves as the president of the California Scholarship Federation and Black Student Union. Beyond her academic and leadership roles, Nyla has a passion for the sciences, constantly wanting to expand her mind. She loves to travel and is, is fascinated by different cultures and is eager to explore diverse perspectives. Inspired by her mother, who serves as her role, as well as her own interest in medicine, Nyla is driven to make the difference by shedding light on the challenges faced by her community. Please welcome to the TEDx stage, Nyla King Boyd. This is my mom. I love to brag about her the way parents brag about their kids. She's a first generation Guyanese American who's worked extremely hard for everything that she has. And I aspire to be just like her. She's truly one of a kind. But in a more literal sense, as of 2020, she's part of the 2.8% of black female physicians in the United States. The lack of black representation in healthcare has become a huge issue in the US. Black people have played a significant role in the field of medical advancement and discovery over the past 200 years, including both medical professionals and those who were subject to unethical experimentation. Yet for being so crucial in the advancement of medicine, they receive subpar healthcare compared to their white counterparts. According to KFF, an independent source for health policy research, black people had higher health risks associated with COVID-19, with them being 2.5 times more likely to be hospitalized after infection and 1.7 times more likely to die. Yet despite these increased health risks, black people were less likely to get vaccines for COVID-19. This is just one of many examples. Today, I'll be diving into these disparities and how we can work together to bridge the gap and further our goal of reaching racial equality in this country. Now, it's hard to fully understand these disparities without going back in time. From the 18th to early 20th century, white physicians studied black slaves and their descendants. They believed that all health questions could be answered in the body. Thus, if black people had worse health outcomes than white people, it must be attributable to some innate racial weakness. 
This research significantly contributed to the construction of harmful racial narratives in the United States, many of which can still be seen in the lives and health of African Americans today. In 1787, a British doctor named Benjamin Mosley claimed that black people could bear surgical pr procedures much more than white people. He explained that a surgical procedure that would cause immense pain to a white man, such as a leg amputation, would feel like almost nothing to a black man. These misconceptions about pain tolerance also allowed physician J. Marion Sims, who was long celebrated as the father of modern gynecology, to use enslaved black women as subjects in experiments that would be unimaginable today, performing painful procedures at a time when anesthesia was not in use. Moving forward to segregation and Jim Crow, black Americans still struggled to get the health care that they needed, and medical stereotypes continued to exist. During this time, segregated health care facilities and hospitals were common. Black people had limited access to health care, as many of the available facilities were underfunded and understaffed compared to those serving white populations. Additionally, Jim Crow laws perpetuated economic disparities between white and black communities. Lower socioeconomic status is strongly correlated with poor health outcomes as it affects access to health care, nutrition, and living conditions. During this time, Henrietta Lacks, an African-American woman born in 1920, unknowingly became a pivotal figure in medical history due to the extraordinary properties of her cells. In 1951, during a routine medical procedure at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, cells were taken from her cervix without her consent. These cells, known as HeLa cells, were unique in their ability to multiply indefinitely outside the body leading to numerous medical breakthroughs, such as the development of the polio vaccine, advancements in cancer research, and insights into the effect of radiation and toxins. However, it wasn't until 1975, over two decades after her cells were taken, that her family was informed of their existence. This lack of informed consent and acknowledgement of Henrietta Lacks's contributions highlight the historical exploitation of black bodies in research. Today, beliefs regarding physician mistrust among African Americans are reinforced by inequitable treatment in comparison to white Americans. A recent study has shown that a lack of cultural diversity and competency among physicians has strongly contributed to this widespread uncertainty. Now, with all this in mind, how can we fix this issue that we're having in the healthcare system? It's simple, through representation. We can encourage black youth to pursue careers in medicine and healthcare. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, how will this help address the issue at hand? Well, let me explain. When black doctors treat black patients, their health improves and the mortality rates decrease. This cultural competency fosters a sense of trust and improves doctor-patient communication. According to Provider Solutions and Development, when black doctors treat black patients, their health outcomes significantly improve. Moreover, when black men were treated by black doctors, they were more likely to follow preventative health care measures than those who were visited by white doctors. Additionally, individuals who saw black doctors received 47% more flu vaccines and 72% more cholesterol screenings. By encouraging black youth to pursue careers in health care, we can increase the number of positive outcomes. I am overjoyed to share that I have been presented with the amazing opportunity to pursue my bachelor's degree at Harvard University in the fall, where I intend to pursue a career in medicine and be the change that I hope to see in the world. As a black woman myself, I am aware of the underrepresentation of black professionals in healthcare, as well as, as well as the systemic barriers that hinder black youth from accessing these professions. My upbringing and experiences have instilled in me a strong sense of duty to advocate and serve those who have been historically discriminated against. One organization also dedicated to this goal is Black Men in White Coats. This initiative is committed to increasing the representation of black men in healthcare through exposure, inspiration, and mentorship. They have partnered with medical schools nationwide to create online documentary videos highlighting the importance of addressing the underrepresentation of black men in medicine. Additionally, they have partnered with Diverse Medicine Incorporated to create and implement an innovative web-based e-mentoring model. This model facilitates mentorship for pre-medical students across the nation who are facing challenges such as financial constraints, time limitations, and geographic distances. Additionally, this initiative hosts Youth Summits, which are community-led events designed to connect medical professionals with underrepresented black youth. 
These summits educate young teachers, students, parents, and community leaders about the path to becoming a medical professional. As I conclude today, I want to emphasize the importance of supporting initiatives that foster diversity in healthcare. It is crucial that we break down the barriers that hinder black youth from accessing these professions. My mom's role goes beyond her achievements. She not only serves as a role model to me, but to other black children who rarely see someone like her in that position. Together, we can create a healthcare system that mirrors the diversity of our society, ensuring equal access, trust, and positive outcomes for all. Thank you. Up next is Nate Jorgensen. Nate Jorgensen is a sophomore from Black Mountain Ranch. He's actively involved in football, rowing, and the JV track and field team. He also serves as an ambassador for Christ. Inspired by his travels and a brief stint of living in the moment, he strives to educate his audience on the connection between taking photos and the vacation experience. Please welcome to the stage, Nate. What do these photos mean to you? To you, probably nothing at all. All you see is some pictures of a kid and his grandpa. To me, however, they represent so much more. I see these photos as priceless pages in a history book of my own life. A history book that's not created in memory, but rather being recorded on a phone. We live in an age where memories are recorded on devices in, devices in our pocket. Let me share with you the story behind these images. These were taken last summer on a trip to Europe I took with my grandfather. 18 days, nine countries, constantly moving from one spot to the next and taking photos of each place we visited along the way. In our short race to visit as many countries as possible, we were led to Prague, the capital of Czechia. I recall one moment that stands out from my time there. There's me, standing in the house of my great-great-grandfather, a place which is marked by a history of occupation, from the Nazis then the Soviets, and now serves as the Embassy Moldova. This is a vacation I will never forget. I was the first member of my family to enter that home in over 70 years, and all I could think about was the best hallway to take a photo in. I made the expert decision that it was, in fact, this hallway. But that's besides the fact. I was so enthralled with the idea of filling my phone with useless pixels that I wasn't taking in the meaningful memories and history. Vacation is meant to be a time for relaxation from the distractions of life and making long-lasting memories. It's defined as a time of respite from something. The word vacation can be rooted back to the Latin word vacatio, meaning exemption from service, respite from work, and traces back even further to vacare, which means to be empty, be free, and have leisure. We need to relieve ourselves of the distractions of life and reside within the moment. Travelers need to step away from their cameras when on vacation. The volume of photos taken needs to be limited. A medium is necessary for memories to be captured naturally, and the psychological impact of overuse of photography is far greater than many assume. This is a quote that often resonates with me, spoken by American landscape photographer Ansel Adams. You don't take a photograph, you make it. Ansel is celebrated for being one of the first photographers of the American West, and his most iconic image being the face of Half Dome at Yosemite National Park. Adams made the nearly 4,000-foot trek through heavy snow to reach the viewpoint as seen in the picture. Adams later noted being at Yosemite was one of the most exciting moments of his photographic career. Adams' experience at Yosemite reveals the significance of being in the moment rather than focusing through a lens. Adams didn't take the picture. He took the experience. He lived in a time when photography was not as ingrained into society as it is now. However, he understood the importance of living in the present. The constant need to document every experience on vacation can lead to missed moments of mindfulness because you're too focused on trying to capture the perfect picture rather than taking in the beauty of the experience. Allow me to set the stage for you. Imagine being at the Eiffel Tower, one of the most coveted destinations for many travelers and a place I'm sure a few people in this room have experienced. And of those few people, I guarantee you were all there for one thing, the picture. I've experienced it firsthand. I found myself wandering from one side of the tower to the other, 
in search of the perfect location, looking to see where flocks of others had decided it was. Just glance at this image of people at the tower. Look again to see how many are there, just for the picture. Isn't that shocking? Well, it isn't. It's a situation repeated multiple times. People capturing the perfect image rather than immersing themselves into the moment. We need to find a medium in order for our memories to be captured naturally. When taking photos develops into us detracting from our experiences, we become impacted psychologically. Psychologist Linda Henkel created a study with 28 college students and asked them to take photos of 15 random objects one by one. Her results revealed an impairment effect among subjects. This means photoed information is less likely to be remembered than non-photographed information. Hankel also claimed that as soon as you hit click on that camera, it's as if you've outsourced your memory. Hankel's findings interpret the actions behind taking photos and how it relieves our brain of the need to form memories properly. In doing so, we are blindly diminishing our experiences and compromising ourselves from engaging in the present moment. Therefore, it is vital for us to find balance in our photo taking habits. We must be present and in the moment. Advancements in technology have led to a recession in true experiences and a culture of collecting photos rather than a time for creating true experiences. An intermediate must be established to allow us to log our life without logging out of it. Many people may not believe this is a relevant issue, and many are wrong. Nine years or 78,894 hours. According to a 2020 study, Americans spend an average of nine years of their life using their phones. We can spend nearly a decade glued to a screen, but can't spend a few days unattached to it, nor can we live in the present moment. In fact, 46.9% of our waking hours are spent thinking about something other than the present. We're not living in the moment, we're distracted, and we're losing time in key moments. If you take just one thing away from what I've said today, it's that the next time you're trying to capture that perfect picture, step back and think, what do these pictures mean to me? Life isn't meant to be lived through a lens. It's meant to be lived in the present. Thank you. Up next is Ada Fultz. Ada is from Carlsbad and is part of the girls varsity basketball team. She's a member of the female athletic volunteer program and her inspiration for her talk is about her journey with social media and TikTok and how it, and how it affects mental health. Give it up for Ada. Is your For You page really good for you? How many of you have TikTok? How many of you have laughed out loud to a TikTok? How many of you have cried or teared up at a TikTok? Me too. And TikTok knows you have. They've manipulated you to laugh. They've literally made you cry. TikTok makes you feel emotions that you feel in real life, but through a screen. And some emotions that may not even be there. Let me paint a picture for you. You get home from a long day. And let's say it was a really, really bad day. Your dog got out of the house again, you failed your math test, and your mom yelled at you for your outfit again. Let's say you get home from this long day, and you lay in your bed, and you open TikTok with the hope to feel instantly energized and entertained. And instead, the first TikTok you see is something like this. Or this. Or this. And let's say you see this TikTok, and you already had a bad day, so you relate. You like that video. You favorite that video. You may even repost that video. This is ruining you. And these TikTok creators' feelings are real. Their situations are real. But something like this makes you think of a situation you never even thought of in the first place. And now you have more problems than you started with. And this doesn't just apply for TikTok. Your Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, they all have the same effect. But I can't blame it all on the platform. You're the one encouraging it. By liking a video, TikTok will automatically recommend videos by that, by that creator with that sound and about those ideas. By reposting a video, that video will then show up on more of your mutual friends for you pages. 
by favoriting a video, you can then look back on it and remember exactly how it made you feel. There is a button you can press that says, not interested. And TikTok will stop showing you videos with that sound by that creator and about those ideas. You can go further as to filter the hashtags that you see on TikTok. For example, hashtag eating disorder, hashtag depression, hashtag life sucks, hashtag hate my life, which are all real hashtags that trend on TikTok today. So it isn't out of your control. You can choose if you want your day to end in a funny video of a dog barking at a toaster or a new insecurity. And don't get me wrong, TikTok isn't all negative because there are many sides to TikTok and you just have to know what to look for. There's bride talk, dance talk, there's dog talk, there's book talk, and there's a special side of TikTok that changed my life, Hopecore. If you look up Hopecore on TikTok, you'll see a variety of videos that look like this. And this. And this. And in particular, a video that changed my life and influenced this TED Talk altogether. These videos are a breath of fresh air, and they remind you something as small as, your smile is beautiful, and something as big as, life is worth living. So I realized, not only should you avoid the negative, but you should search for the positive by interacting with videos like this. And this. It might just change your day. After all, it changed my life. I'll give you the same scenario. You get home from a long day, and it was that same very, very bad day. And you get home, and you open TikTok, and this is the first video you see. This year has been the worst year of my life by far. This may not have been the worst year of your life, but it sure feels like it right now. So once again, you like that video, you favorite that video, you repost that video. How did that make your day better? How did that make your week better? How did that make your month better? And how did that make your already bad year better? Short answer, it didn't. Just because you have a bad day doesn't mean you have a bad life. In the same way that just because you see a bad TikTok doesn't mean you have that same bad situation. Because TikTok finds a way to take already existing feelings and replace them with much more drastic and dramatic feelings. And it's not good for you. We have to change it. This is such a deep calling of mine because I experienced a lot of really real and really hard feelings in a dark time in my life. And I found I was relating to, or at least wanting to relate to, TikToks that only worsened my condition. And I think I thought, hey, as long as everyone else on TikTok's having a bad day, I can too. I don't want to have another bad day, and I don't want any of you to either. So much of my own depression and anxiety stemmed from feelings that TikTok made me feel. And I found, once I started avoiding the negative, by getting off of depression TikTok and searching for the positive by getting on hope for TikTok, my mental health increased immensely. And I'm not saying TikTok and social media are the only main contributor to mental health, but I'm saying, what if mental health issues can be avoided by the press of a not interested button? I even started posting my own hope for TikToks. And I'm not asking you to post your own hope for TikTok, but I guess that couldn't hurt but I'm asking you and informing you. Be aware of what's on your For You page. After all, it's called a For You page. And why wouldn't you want your life to be positive? So next time your mom says, it's because of that damn phone, instead of rolling your eyes, sit and think, maybe it is. Thank you. Next is Robert. Robert Day is a sophomore from Rancho Santa Fe. He plays football and throws for their track and field team. He's also a member of Academic League as well as National Honor Society and National Art Honor Society. Outside of school, he volunteers at his church and through an organization called Teen Volunteers in Action. He was inspired to write his talk by his concern for the current divided state of the country. Please welcome Robert. This is a bridge I rebuilt with my dad and brother. It was not a particularly easy process. Pulling out old boards and shifting massively heavy concrete posts is not always a fun start to a weekend. 
All aspects of building it, including leveling dirt, moving lumber, and evenly painting the new planks required some care and attention to detail. During its restoration, I dreaded going back out and continuing to work, often thinking to myself, what's the point of this? This sucks. It's towards the end of the project, though, that I realized all the effort was a necessity. The labor of building the bridge was worth ending the discomfort and difficulty of getting from one side to the other. Americans today seem to be split on either side of a divide. Arguments become easily heated. People are often immediately judged by their political association, no matter what it may be. And widespread separation is creating a vaster and vaster gap. A bridge can and must be built to foster unity, and you can be one of the people who builds it. The vision in America has gone too far, but we can contribute to its decline by acknowledging the humanity of each other. More specifically, rather than reducing each other to only contrasting views, we can attempt to un understand each other and fight bias. And instead of allowing argument and hate to characterize interaction, we can exercise civil discourse and seek out common ground. Ask yourself, should Americans continue to align with one political faction with the key characteristic of membership being disdain for the alternative? Or should we work to understand each other and grow into a more united States of America? One of the causes of this increasing disunity is that the preferences or perceptions people hold that pertain to particular topics are largely impacted by biased media. Consider this bias chart created using information from public benefit corporations, all sides, and ad fontes media. Raise your hand if you or someone close to you consumes news from one of these outlets. Okay, keep your hands raised for a second and look around the room. Note the hands that are raised. This social application indicates that whether you like it or not, bias is seeping into news that the people around you and you take in. Unless you actively read articles from the other side of the chart, it is likely that this bias has influenced you to some degree. My point is that when there are highly accessible outlets that paint pictures of world events for hundreds of thousands of people to see that correspond to certain agendas and who drive revenue by being clicked on the most, it is inevitable that division will develop. Modern computer algorithms don't help much either. When people are being continually fed media with which it has been established that they agree, little room is left for understanding or even acknowledgement of dissimilar viewpoints. If one person were to read articles solely from Fox News and another solely from MSNBC, it is safe to assume they'd have different perceptions of current events. Do you think person A and person B will have an easy time getting along? Maybe, maybe not. Well, what do we do about this problem? I alluded to it a second ago, but you can give reading an article from an alternative outlet on a different location of the bias spectrum a try. Maybe not a hyper-partisan one, but one from a more center lane is definitely worth a shot. This would help in the fight for understanding. I should also add that there are resources available to help determine the extent of bias present in media outlets. One such website, which was one of the sources in the formulation of the previously mentioned bias chart, is adfontismedia.com. They actually have their own extensive interactive bias chart, among other resources. But more broadly, if we are to bridge the gap, empathy is a must. One of my sources of entertainment, when I'm not busy feeling super unsettled by the divided state of our nation, is the act of scrolling through comment sections online and reading arguments between strangers on any number of topics. I doubt I'm the only one here who has done this. In my experience, the arguments are seldom civil and certainly don't exhibit empathy. They are reply after reply of beliefs clouded with insults shoved down opposing commenters' throats. Never is it asked, what makes you believe this, sir? How or why did you come to this conclusion? In early elementary school, I remember there was a strong emphasis on teaching us about empathy, including a song we would sing. I also remember I didn't really understand what it meant. Now, though, I realize the teachers were onto something. I have more recently implemented empathetic thinking into my life, and I truly believe it has helped me grow as a person. If you, too, try to find common ground with whomever you deem to be the opposition and with whomever you have unintentionally reduced to only views they hold, it would make it much more difficult to get into the cycle of vicious argument. The idea that people get reduced to only their views is an issue in itself. This has led to deterioration of relationships, particularly in recent years. I myself have witnessed and known people who are no longer in contact with each other because of political disagreement. In the heated political climate today, association with a person who seems unsavory to some is often enough to break long-standing bonds of family and friendship. It must be reasserted that people are more than just their political association. 
While values people hold are important characteristics, it is almost never the case that differences are truly so severe that communication and friendliness are impossible. Reparation of relationships reveals itself to be an important step towards unity. To be clear, I am not suggesting you ignore the beliefs with which you disagree. In contrast, civil discourse is an important part of democracy and progress. However, civility must be emphasized, common ground needs to be sought out, and compromise should be kept in mind. I previously suggested ways in which a sense of unity could be fostered on an individual level, but if applicable, the restoration of broken relationships is a more powerful way to fight polarization today. The already severe division present in our society will continue to worsen, plaguing future generations and resulting in nothing productive. It must be stopped. As Latin writer Publilius Sirius said, where there is unity, there is victory. We, as Americans, need to put the effort in to reunite if we want to fully prosper. As an individual, you can plant the seeds of union by acknowledging the similarities of those who seem different, by trying to understand what makes their differences. As a relative or friend, you can reestablish contact with one who has been estranged, demonstrating that there is more value in a restored relationship than a destroyed one. You can be the one to start bridging the gap. Thank you. Uh, I would say my favorite thing so far is one, the networking. Here's a great place to network, especially starting from a young age. Second are these name tags. What does yours say? Oh, mine? Mine says I love dancing, meditation, and traveling. What does yours say? Uh, mine says I love soccer, living life, and backflips. That's so cool. Let's give a round of applause to our amazing committee members who put these together. Okay. Next up is Summer Gill. Summer is a sophomore from Carlsbad. She has participated in crew, field hockey, lacrosse, and soccer. She loves being a part of the speech and debate team and is also the founder and president of the Scuba Diving and Ocean Conservation Club. She has known since a very young age that she wanted to go into law and public service. And this, and this journey does continue tonight as she shares her passion for the ocean, justice, and helping people. Last but not least, Summer. the reality of the Marshall Islands, where the remnants of US nuclear testing haunts the island nation. Locals call it the tomb. The Marshall Islands consist of 29 atolls halfway between Hawaii and Australia. The total land mass is roughly the size of Washington, DC, but is spread over an area about five times the size of California. The first American atomic weapons test in the Marshall Islands began in 1946 and Bikini Atoll. Tests were then transferred to the US mainland at the Nevada test site before being moved back to the Marshall Islands because the new generation of thermonuclear bombs being developed had yields so large that officials feared the radioactive fallout could not be safely contained at any site in the United States. Comedian Bob Hope summed it up best by saying, as soon as the war ended, we located the one spot on Earth that hadn't been touched by war and blew it to hell. As tensions rose with the Cold War, the race to find the bomb to end all bombs continued until 1958. Between 1977 and 1980, the first and only ever United States nuclear cleanup operation was executed, 
an attempt to contain the radioactive waste. This included over 100,000 cubic yards of contaminated soil and debris, the equivalent of over 20 filled swimming pools, all from the Marshall Islands and the Nevada test site. The result was Bruna Dome, a temporary concrete structure located on one of the 40 islands in Anuitaka Atoll. Now you may be wondering why a 16-year-old decided to write a TED talk on something as obscure as Bruna Dome. I come from a scuba diving family. This is a picture of me on my first dive trip in the Philippines at nine years old. One day when I came home from school in 2018, my dad showed me an article about Runa Dome, a leaking nuclear crisis. I was shocked. I formed a club in my fifth, sixth grade combo class to try and solve this crisis. We did research and I dragged my friends to lunch meetings. We didn't get very far, of course, but the idea stuck with me that Runa Dome could be the greatest environmental disaster the world has ever seen. First, I will talk about how the Marshallese Islanders were relocated and then exposed to high levels of radiation during the testing. Secondly, I will illustrate the untold story of the betrayal and suffering of the US servicemen. And lastly, I will talk about why very soon, you will need a radiation suit in order to surf in San Diego. I'll take you back in time. The year is 1954. This is Nergy Joseph. She was seven years old. Little does she know her life is about to change. She wakes up on March 1st to an alarming sight. Two suns in the sky. The second one quickly disappears, and in its place falls snow. Little does her village know it is the fallout from Castle Bravo, an atomic bomb 1,000 times as powerful as Hiroshima. It vaporized an estimated 300 million tons of sand, mud, coral, and water in a fireball and mushroom cloud. Within five minutes, it went all the way up through the stratosphere to 130,000 feet. The toxic snow falls on their food, permeates their water supply, and sticks to their bodies as chemicals like radioactive iodine, cesium, and plutonium wreak havoc. Two days later, the United States arrives to evacuate the Marshallese Islanders, but they're too late. Their hair is falling out in clumps, their skin burned, and they're throwing up everything they eat, radiation poisoning. They return the natives to their homeland three years later to be human guinea pigs. The results? Catastrophic. Cancer, miscarriages, and birth deformities skyrocket. Jellyfish babies are not uncommon, a birth defect where children are born without bones and with translucent skin. Nergy is one of the lucky ones, a survivor of the first and only U.S. hydrogen bomb. The United States detonated a total of 67 atomic bombs in the Marshall Islands. Where there once was islands lie huge craters surrounded by brown radioactive lagoons. For those of you who aren't atomic physicists, plutonium-239, an essential part of the atomic bomb, has a half-life of 24,100 years. This means for the thousands of people forcibly displaced by US nuclear testing, they can never return to their homeland. All right, guys, we have a nuclear cleanup to do. Make sure to grab your shorts and sandals, because the US government won't supply any protective gear. Now I want all of you to reach under your chairs. If there is a yellow ticket under your chair, please look now. I'd like you to raise your hand up in the air. Should have a smiley face on it. Now everybody look around the room. Look how many people are raising their hand. I would like to congratulate you guys, because you survived. <laughs> if not, you're among the 3,600 of 4,000 Anuita cleanup veterans that are now dead. Unfortunately, the rest of you Guess you're not so lucky because you'll soon join them. You've been denied veteran health care. We live in an unpredictable era. Temperatures rising, crazy weather patterns, and more fragile and dangerous species than ever before. Brunet Dome, which is only 25 feet above sea level to begin with, will be at least partially submerged by the end of the century. 
This will accelerate erosion of the dome, which I forgot to mention, is leaking. It works like a toilet. Radiation seeps out through the permeable soil into the nearby lagoon. It is then flushed out with the tide into the Pacific Ocean. Alternatively, the waste in San Onofre is contained in steel cylinders inside multiple layers of concrete. The Runa Dome is sinking, cracked, and has no concrete lining. So at any point in time, this slow leak could turn into a tidal wave of radiation infecting our coastline. The people of the Marshall Islands did not ask to have their homeland poisoned. Over 4,000 U.S. servicemen did not want to die slow, painful deaths of radiation poisoning. And I know my generation certainly did not ask to have the weight of the world on our shoulders. But it has happened. As Americans, we must work to amend the mistakes of the past and create a brighter future for everyone. We must aid the Marshallese Islanders and provide financial reparations, give the remaining veterans the free health care they deserve, and find a permanent solution for Runa Dome before it pollutes the entire Pacific Ocean. Otherwise, the only tomb will be our own. Hi everyone, my name is Luna Smith and I'm the other lead director of TEDx. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. If you haven't already, please follow us on Instagram at TEDxCCHS. We'll be, we will be posting photos and videos of the event as well as keeping you updated about next year's event. To start, I'd like to present our most dedicated student committee member. This committee member has been dedicated this entire year and has been coming up with innovative ideas throughout the entire year. Can I please welcome Kalani to the stage? <laughs> Kalani, please come to the stage. Thank you. We're good. We're good. Thank you. It's fine. Thank you. We'll come forward. <laughs> Thank you, Kalani. Kalani has been on our social media team and he's done such an amazing job this entire year. Let's give him another round of applause. Next, I'd like to present our best speaker in the spotlight. Can Lindsay Zimmer please come to the stage? <laughs> Lindsay's talk was so amazing, and I love learning about our gut microbiome. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to thank everyone who has made this event possible. It's been such an amazing, it's been so amazing, and I'm so thankful for everyone's help. Thanks to Mr. Rodriguez and Mrs. Grieven for their help with facilities and food. Thank you to Mr. Nguyen and his video production crew. Thanks to the Dawn's Vision live broadcasting team. Thanks to Mr. Devera and Mrs. Poe for creating a stunning social media post introducing our speakers to the community. Thank you to John Kay for, pho for photographing our event. Thank you to Principal Conroy and Dr. Culkins for their leadership and for their support of student voices. Thank you to all the parents who brought food to rehearsals, volunteered the day of, gave feedback to speakers, and donated the signage, pins, stickers, and balloons that brought this event to life. Thank you to Lily, Chase, and Alyssa for creating our TED speaker workbook. Thank you to Chase, Alyssa, Megan, and Anna for designing and creating our stage. Thank you to Liz and Lucas P for designing our programs. Thank you to Lucas C for creating our intro and ending animations. Thank you to Lucas P for illustrating our logo and designing our hoodies and programs. Thank you to Kalani, Quincy, Vaughn, and Ashley for managing our social media and posting reels. Thank you to Avery, Kira, Hannah, Allison, and Pearl for designing our event, and Kira for making our amazing cookies. Thank you to Lily and Anna for managing our slide design logistics. And thank you to every student committee member who put so much effort into this event and, into this event and spent all of their time and energy, and for mentoring each of their speakers. Can I please welcome the TEDx student committee to the stage?
next, I'd like to welcome our directors to, to the stage. Our directors manage their committees in our student committee and led our entire committee throughout this entire year. Ooh, please come to the stage. Next, I'd like to welcome our speakers and MCs to the stage. Speakers, thank you so much for all your dedication you put into making your talks and sharing your voices. Thank you. I'd like to thank Ms. Fiore and Mr. Three for being such amazing mentors throughout this entire process. Please come to the stage. <laughs> thank you, you guys have been so amazing throughout this entire process and we're so thankful for you all. Thank you. everyone for attending this year's TEDx event and we're so grateful for all of your support. We hope to see you next year as well.
anybody else with a mic on? Just let them know. Go home and sleep. <laughs> Don't do anything. Thanks, Thanks,